folks, my name is Jen, and today I have for you a video going into my top 10 uh, best books that I read in 2021. So I'm actually going to do something slightly different than what I did last year, um, and that is uh, set a limit. Like I said, I have chosen my top 10 after some serious deliberation and I will actually be going in order from the I guess least best to best best yeah okay we'll call it that so all right so let's get into this uh, first of all with me mentioning um, like honorable mention books uh, the honorable mentions are two books that I reread for middle grade March, um, and they are Holes by Lewis Sacker and Ramona Quimby, age 8 by Beverly Cleary. Uh, these books were both childhood favorites of mine. Holes, like I knew that Holes was a great book, but I'd really forgotten how badass this book was. Uh, there's, you know, fate, friendship, and adventure, and it also tackles important issues like the juvenile detention system, uh, racism, classism. I think that this is such a great book that managed to tackle those things for children and, and did it very well. And Ramona Quimby, while this, there are certain sections of this that definitely date it, <laughs> uh, in many ways, uh, definitely showing that it was created in the early 80s. At the same time, there are parts of it that are timeless, like just wanting to fit in, making a good impression on the people around us and your teacher when you're starting in a new school, um, finding things unfair that you have to deal with when you're, you know, a kid and kind of at the throes of what the adults around you um, say you have to do or put up with. And uh, in some ways, I, I feel like this had more meaning for me as an adult than it did when I was myself eight years old. So then let's get into the actual list. So we'll start with number 10, Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. Acevedo's writing is just purely gorgeous. It's supremely lyrical and emotion filled. This is the second uh, book in verse of hers that I have read and I just overall love the way that Acevedo writes. While I admit that I didn't quite love Clap When You Land as much as I loved The Poet X when I read it last year, it was still such a beautifully told story. It's not only full of like grief and loss, especially the loss of a parent, but it also deals with the anger of learning the secrets that the person you lost had and had kept from you and kind of dealing with all the complicated uh, feelings that come along with suddenly finding family that you you were not aware of. I really like that this also gave a glimpse into a tragedy that I think the majority of people here in the US were not aware of. I know I personally had not heard of it until this book um, and I think that was since it seems like most of the folks were uh, Dominican people who were going home or um, Dominican Ameri American like family members who were just going for like a visit uh, and I think that is probably partially why we didn't hear a lot about it and a large part of it being lesser known also probably has to do with the fact that this tragedy took place around the same time as September 11th, so the news feeds in general were just 
completely overrun by 9-11. So, like most other, like, tragedies, any other tragedies that were occurring in well, in the world, but especially in the U.S., we're just not really get, garnering a lot of attention at that time either. It was, this plane crash was also such a tragic loss of life, and I'm really glad to uh, have read this book and that this book exists to make other readers more aware of it. Number nine is The Blood of Olympus by Rick Wright Orton. It was almost a tie, to be honest, between House of Hades and this, but I really love some of the events that happened in this last book even more than the events that happened in book four. So this slightly like went over that one. I do know that this conclusion to the series has had some like mixed reviews. Um, I guess the ending it could be seen coming from a mile away if you're really looking at it, but. I mean, that didn't stop me from loving, like, every minute of it. So, a confession to make that I feel like I've probably talked about before <laughs> when talking about these books was that I was not really a fan of Jason, um, really at all. Uh, but by the end of this series, especially this book, I have basically come around to a begrudging, okay, he's a good guy. Feeling. Um, all of the characters throughout the series, especially in this book, I all the different perspectives we got, I really liked. Um, I did ultimately miss having that closely held point of view from Percy because his snark is just the majority of what makes Percy Jackson the Olympian so great. So I did miss a lot of his, like, internal snark um, in this series, but I did really enjoy being able to get more insight into other characters that we'd met in the previous series, like Annabeth and Nico. And I also really enjoyed meeting, like, this whole new cast of characters as well. Sweet, sweet Nico. My favorite part probably was being able to get more insight into Nico and also Leo. Leo is just wonderful. Well, ultimately, I think that I adore Percy Jackson and the Olympians more than the Heroes of Olympus series. I still really had a great time full of like really emotional ups and downs reading this series. And this was just exactly the kind of conclusion that I was ultimately hoping for. <laughs> Number eight is Taran Wanderer by Lloyd Alexander. So this is book four uh, in the five part series, The Chronicles of Prydain. Uh, all along through this series, Taran of Caer Dalvin has been showing growth. He started out as this like really hot-headed, impulsive, rude-ass, slightly misogynistic kid and over the course of the series he slowly developed into an intelligent warrior who fights when he needs to but also knows when it's better to use his words. This book though it's like not um, like the final book in the series, it did feel like a culmination in Taryn's character development. He just really comes into his own in this novel. Taryn as the Wanderer uh, starts his journey to find out his parentage so he can both know truly who he is and where he comes from and also be able to propose marriage to his love because he feels like if he doesn't know his parentage, it's not appropriate for him to propose. His journey takes him to old familiar faces as well as new places and people. He learns about all of Pradain as he travels across it from the nobles to the common folk and in doing so he also learns a lot more about himself. 
though at times I missed having the constant chatter of Princess Eloi or the sheer ridiculousness of Fluter Flam the Bard, I just really loved that this entire thing was focused on Taran and his internal struggles, not only what's going on externally for him. I still uh, hadn't been a hundred percent on board with him as the main protagonist in the other three books, although he had grown on me, but he just won me over completely in this book. It was my favorite book, and to be honest, I think it's the best out of the whole bunch. Number seven is From the Desk of Zoe Washington by Janae Marks. So first and foremost, this book is just absolutely adorable. Zoe is such an ambitious kid, totally planning to be a professional, like, baker when she's an adult. She wants to be on, like, this food network uh, baking competition for kids, and it's like, I mean, I, I could not have imagined having that much ambition when I was 12 years old, so I just thought she's, first of all, really awesome. Um, I loved the parts having to do with baking, uh, her lear learning more things, and her baking things, obviously. Uh, I also really enjoyed uh, the bits having to do with her family and friends, her relationships with them, and the letters that she shares back and forth with her biological father, who is incarcerated. There's a playlist that uh, Zoe makes from song suggestions that her um, father Marcus sends her in the letters and that playlist is so sweet. I have listened to those songs a couple of times and one of them, Hang On Little Tomato, is probably my favorite of that bunch and it's currently on my Cheer Up playlist on Spotify. <laughs> this is such an important story, tackling firstly uh, children whose parents are in prison and secondly wrongful convictions. I know out there in the world there's a lot of folks, uh, especially older folks, who believe that you can't talk about different parts of life, i.e. other people's life experiences, uh, with children that is just going to upset them or they're not going to understand it or they're just going to be confused and you know we can't upset the little children but I mean it is important to have people especially children know that there are other perspectives in the world and other children can go through varying things in childhood as well and I also think it's really important because any child who is going through something like this I I think it's a very important book for them to see themselves represented as well and have something that they can relate to and take comfort in. Also this book clearly shows that you can really discuss those big important issues with children and it can be done in a clear, kind, but truthful way for kids to understand. But just because this is like middle grade does not mean it's just for kids. I would highly recommend this for anyone of like any age. Number six is The Girl Who Speaks Bear by Sophie Anderson. So this has bears in it, so you know I love it. Besides the bears though, there are, is also like a forest full of animals, there's animals in the town including a sassy house weasel who I just love. The animals and the human characters are all really quirky and entertaining and the way they are described as well as the way that everything in this book is described really, uh, whether it be the town, the people, the animals, the forest, the food, I mean it, the descriptions throughout are just incredibly beautiful and it also just really draws you you into this world. So the the little fairy tales interspersed within this fairy tale are lovely. I like that they're a part of the main story itself while giving atmosphere 
to it and adding to like the the world of Yonka's journey. I love also the little bits of truth within the fantasy as well. The emotions are also kind of high in this. Uh, it deals with loss and family, friendship, and finding out your past and who you truly are. Seems to be a theme with some of the books. Some of my favorites list. <laughs> I just really loved taking this journey with Yonka for reasons I'm still trying to figure out. I bawled like a baby while I was reading this, especially towards the end of it, but I mean I didn't mind it. It was actually kind of cathartic. <laughs> Number five is Anne of Green Gables by Ella Montgomery. So this was just absolutely delightful, but I'm not always certain that as a, a kid I would have been able to deal with someone as overly dramatic as Anne, as a friend, as an adult who has moved more into the maternal side of life, I guess. Um, there's something about her that makes me want to just hug her. Her temper I <laughs> can understand in a lot of ways. Um, her need for love and clear lack of it previously in her life just made me want to adopt her myself. From following on her mishaps as a little kid to still being the same irrepressible and just slightly less loosey goosey crazy as a teenager, it was just wonderful to re-experience this story. So I always remember loving Matthew. Like, he is just one of the sweetest characters ever in fiction and I just really adore him. But this time around, I mean, I still really love him. He's just freaking the original cinnamon roll. But, I mean, this time I found myself really loving Marilla as well. Her internal thoughts throughout the book, her growth of character over time was just really wonderful to watch happen. I know that Anne is like the main character and the point of the book would ultimately be to see her character development. But to watch Marilla Cuthbert just change and warm and really show not only her generous side but how loving of a person she is, it was just honestly it was the best. It was the best part of this book. And I also can't talk about this book as being one of the best things I read this year without mentioning, of course, the lovely descriptions of Prince Edward Island. With each season there are just more beautiful scenes of nature to take in. I really love that appreciating and loving nature and the outside world are such big things in this book and also in the series in general, but really in this book. Rereading this again reminded me of how much I really, really want to visit Prince Edward Island. You know, when things are pretty much back to normal-ish, of course. But yeah, this was definitely, I think, my, my favorite thing that I reread this year was, was this book. I just appreciated it so much more as an adult, I think, than I appreciated than I did or could um, when I read this when I was 16. So for number four, I actually have a dual book thing to talk about, uh, mainly because they're both by the same author and they're both collections of poetry. Um, and that is I'll Fly Away and also Helium by Rudy Francisco. You have I'll Fly Away. I've just lent it out so I don't currently have it on me. Um, but yeah, both collections of poetry are just amazing. Rudy Francisco can just make you feel so many emotions throughout his works. His words can like open your eyes, make you laugh, feel like a, a warm hug from a friend, or an emotional punch to the gut when a line really connects. I'll Fly Away is set up kind of like a dictionary. 
uh, where he created and also made definitions for various words and uh, then he had like the poems in each section relating to those definitions. I, I really loved that. I thought that was a very like cool and, and playful thing to do, but it was also very meaningful and I really enjoyed all of the poems in that collection um, and I really enjoyed how it was set up. A lot of the poems packed an extremely powerful punch. Uh, some of them were very quite relevant and overall it was just an extremely impactful collection. Helium was his debut collection and this also tackles some of the same issues, focusing on love, uh, relationships, loss of relationships, depression and dealing with that, figuring out truths about yourself and others, and also um, his place in the world as a young black man. It was just as powerful of a collection and I recognized here and there some of the poems um, that he has performed uh, that I've, I've seen online in different places and I also really liked being able to see those poems in their original forms and these books just really solidified for me why he is one of my favorite poets. Number three is Seance Tea Party by Ray Monaghi. So first off with this book. You gotta mention the artwork. I, I just have to talk about the artwork. Just look at how beautiful this is. It's so colorful and charming. The brightness of it and the fantastical little imaginary friends um, and little creatures that Laura always kind of seems to imagine around her really show off the childish and playful side of the story. And I really mean childish in a, a, a very good way. So there's a ghost. Love a good ghost story. And this has to do with a ghost becoming friends with a spooky imaginative girl. This book utterly destroyed me. Like, I'm, I'm talking full-blown ugly cry. I'm talking tissues, snot, hugging this book to my chest while I'm hiding under a blanket. Like, like the whole shebang. Please read this. It'll most likely destroy you too. But it, it will be worth it. It's just, it's so beautiful. And take it from someone who also had an Im active imagination growing up and was also really afraid of growing up at one time. This book is just so comforting and, and heart-wrenching, but so very, very beautiful. Uh, number two is I Hope You're Listening by Tom Ryan. So this involves a podcast. I love podcasts, especially those of the true crime variety. At the fact that the uh, protagonist created a podcast where she can anonymously try to help other laptop laptop detectives raise awareness and try to help um, find people who are missing. I mean, it it's just amazing. Like, first of all, it's a awesome like concept for this book, but it's also just amazing in general. The fact that she has done this as a way to make up for the guilt she still feels at not remembering how exactly her childhood best friend disappeared in the woods when they were seven, that part is just heartbreaking. There are glimpses into the past in here which gives some insight into Dee's childhood and her friendship with Sibby, who is the friend that went missing. I just really liked seeing Dee's relationships with other people, uh, namely her family, friends, and the budding romance between her and another character. And I really also liked the little transcripts um, from the podcast as well. I thought that was really cool. The climax of this story is basically all I could have hoped for and more. 
Um, overall, this was just a freaking bomb book, and I was on the edge of my seat, sweaty palms and all while I was reading this. This is probably one of the best mystery thrillers I have read in a while. And number one, the, the top book that I read in 2021 was Holopox, The Hunt for Morgan Crow by Jessica Townsend. I love the found family in this book. Whether it's Morgan's relationship with her friends or with those of the hotel where she resides, I, I just love watching how these relationships grow. It just really warms my heart. Found family is a trope that I really love. It's honestly probably my favorite trope and this book just this whole series so far just does it so perfectly. Each book in this series has expanded and fleshed out this world. Um, I love learning more about Nevermore as as the book go on. Um, I, I really love learning more about Nevermore and its history, the magic system, the people there, and most of all getting uh, glimpses into Morgan's own past. The world though it, it's really cool and fantastical, also has a sketchier side as well, but I, in all honesty, I would still love to really visit this world if it existed. I also did like that we got to see more of the shitty side of Nevermore. Um, it put certain things into more context, and it also gave way to a couple of truly badass lines that were in here. It had a pretty timely message about standing up to bigotry as well as the bigotry that could come with, say, a pandemic. <laughs> Part of it felt like it was almost a little too timely in those in instances. I'm, I'm honestly not really ready or um, uh, mentally and emotionally prepared for books, shows, or movies that heavily have to do with COVID yet. I don't know about any of you guys, but I'm not there yet. I'm not while we're still thick in it. But I felt like it it was almost perfect. The the timing of this book with everything else that's going on in the world. I probably mentioned it when I reviewed this book, but this series so far has surpassed Harry Potter as my favorite fictional world that I'm kind of low-key obsessed with. That's like a huge thing because the Harry Potter has been like my fave since I was 10 years old. So like this is, this is huge. Cannot wait for book four when it, when it comes out this fall. I'm so damn excited. So that's it folks. That is my top 10 best books that I read in 2021 plus a couple of honorable mentions uh thank you so much for watching let me know down below what your favorites were in 2021 let me know if any of these were also on your list and uh yeah thanks so much for watching and i will see you in the next video bye